All right, and we're live. Welcome, everybody. This is brand new live Peralta Designs special broadcast here where we talk about uh, branding and marketing live from our creative agency uh, located in Shelton, Connecticut. And we're still practicing social distancing. So Amanda Barnes, our art director, hi, is, <laughs> is reporting live from, from PDHQ. And I'm reporting live from uh, the home base, the home office, uh, as we are still uh, practicing our, our guidelines of phase two here uh, in our headquarters in Connecticut. Uh, we're at 50% in the office and 50% out. But we're super excited uh, to have this really fun topic to talk about uh, today. We're, we are going to talk about logos. And logos is probably the, the, the most fun you can have at any company. Nobody wants to be in on the annual budget conversations or on the profit and loss conversations. But if, if there's any conversation ever about the company logo and the branding and the colors, uh, everybody wants to be in on that. It's, it's the most fun you can have. And, and we're very excited because it is a very, very serious part of developing your brand and launching your brand. And it is the most recognizable aspect of your company. And it's not easy. Uh, Amanda, you will attest yes, that. Yes, I, I can. And I also will say that when everybody wants to be a part of the logo design process, that <laughs> is not fun for the designer. <laughs> exactly. Design by committee is, is terrible. So why do you need a logo? Why do you think, like, I always use this in my brand new presentations, but when a two-year-old is in a car and they're driving by, you know, uh, a McDonald's, you know, they, they know that it's a McDonald's. They can't even read yet. But they have already been indoctrinated into branding because they've seen the Happy Meal, they've seen the fries, they've seen the cups, they've seen the stores. They know the Golden Arches at a very, very early age. And that's the power of branding. And I always recommend uh, Paul Rand, if, if those out there that are interested in, in, in logo design and, and, uh, or, or are trying to come up with one for their company, Paul Rand is like a legend. Uh, as far as logo design, I mean, he did the UPS, he did IBM, he did the next logo for Steve Jobs. His whole thing is like simple. Keep it very, very simple. Uh, and a lot of his logos are, uh, are designs are icons. And as you can see, I'm probably wearing an RPD icon, uh, which, yep, and Amanda sporting it as well. I would recommend for your company that you create, uh, that you have created, or you hire us to create a brand icon for you or a symbol. We're going to talk about that. Why Why am I against people going to like 99designs or Fiverr or any of these agencies? Uh, because you're not going to get something that's proprietary. Uh, you're not going to get something that somebody else might already have or might already be using. And in the, and in the space of branding, you want to have something that uh, you can trademark. So our mark is a registered trademark. Uh, it's a very expensive process, but you want to protect it because you don't want somebody else to use it. And in the marketplace, if you're in a very competitive industry, brand confusion is, is a big reason why you have trademark disputes because one company A could be spending a million dollars in advertising and company B is not. The greatest example of that, speaking of McDonald's, is probably coming to America, right? The, the movie where, you know, you have McDowell's and you have McDonald's. And I remember in that, in that, in that movie, he had, uh, like, the brand guidelines from McDonald's. And he was like, no, 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 we're not copying them. They have, they have the golden arches. You know, we have the golden arc. And, and I forgot. He said they have the, the Big Mac. We have the big Mick, you know, like he just kind of tweaked it a little bit, but essentially he was ripping off uh, McDonald's. Um, so Nike is another one that's an iconic symbol uh, that becomes synonymous. And that, that doesn't happen overnight. For many, many years, the words, the, the word mark of Nike had to be seen alongside the swoosh until eventually you see the swoosh by itself and you know it represents Nike. We've been trying to do that with PD over the last 10 years, and now people are recognizing it as what it means. We don't need to spell out our entire logo, but it takes time. Uh, it takes time, and again, I, I, I listen, you've all got to start somewhere. If you don't have the budget to spend, you know, like the next logo was 100 grand, you know, like Paul Rand uh, charged uh, Steve Jobs 100 grand for that. 
we don't typically charge that much, but it does take time. So it is a cost associated with it. And a lot of people go with these cheaper uh, overseas services because they got to start somewhere. And I'm not knocking your hustle if you've got to start somewhere. But when you're serious about developing your branding, you've got to take it to the next level. And, and then you do some brand evolution in there. Um, but let's talk a little bit, Amanda, about the creative process so that our, our viewers can kind of understand what we go through as artists. When we sit down with someone, we learn about their business, we learn about who they're trying to reach. Talk to us a bit about, I know you hit the sketch pad, so let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. So after we um, kind of consult with the client, figure out what it is exactly that they're looking for, um, if they had any ideas about their preferred symbolism or iconography, the words that are kind of associated with their company, um, I usually start with going into uh, research and sketching phases. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll research um, similar companies just to get an idea of kind of like the look that other their competitors or other companies within the same field are using. Um, and then I'll also do, sometimes I'll do like a word association. If there is a, a word that resonates with the client, then I'll kind of branch off and figure out, okay, this word connects with this sort of symbolism. Um, and then I will start like sketching phases. Uh, I still prefer to start with the, the notebook and pencil, um, drawing it out like really roughly, quickly, getting the ideas down um, before I jump into the digital phase. Um, yeah. Though I do have a, a Surface uh, laptop, which allows me to sketch directly onto my laptop. Uh, yeah. So I can kind of combine both the and digital phases. You know, I, listen, I, I'm with you 100%. I, I have those that know me know I'm a painter. And you're a painter as well. And, and uh, you know, I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts. I'm big on the sketching. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our young designers, and we, we get we get a lot of interns. They want to work for us. They they these, believe it or not, I've met some designers that can't draw, and that that boggles my mind. Yeah, uh, and I went to school with people who couldn't design. Right. They were in the graphic design department, but they couldn't draw, and so right. they were the ones that really struggled uh, because yeah. even though even though it's like you you're not creating this big illustration, you still have to understand like composition you know, creating the right kind of silhouette. Um, and it was a struggle for those who didn't know that whole, right. didn't have that right. it, it, It's a quick way to also get your ideas down on paper. So mm -hmm. what we do, you know, the creative process, I, I, I wear a few hats. One of them is creative director. I love working with Amanda in the early stages where we're getting the look and feel down quickly. So we do what we call thumbnail sketches and they're literally called thumbnails because they're supposed to be small sketches that you do uh, before you go digital, before you vectorize it. And I do want us to talk a little bit about vector versus raster uh, and the difference because a lot of times people are getting raster logos. They're getting somebody that doesn't draw, doesn't use Illustrator, ends up creating a quote unquote logo for them in Photoshop and then they send that sign to like, I mean, that, that image to like a Harry at Minuteman. And he's like, I can't blow this thing up because it's going to pixel it. So mm -hmm. there, there's so much that goes into this where you want a good designer is going to provide you with vector artwork that can scale. Um, and there's so many things to talk about in this in this process. But one of them is um, I like to, I, and, and listen, when, when you're doing this, you're basically taking, for, for those that are out there, you're taking a company's mission statement, um, their value proposition, their differentiator. You're taking all these all these words, right? And you're trying to condense them all into one icon and say, okay, here's your icon that tells that whole story. That That's ultimately, your logo should be telling a story and it should be recognizable and it should be simple and it should be something you could register as a trademark. So it has to be unique. Right, so there's all these things. This is why it's expensive because it's it's a very tall order. A lot of people make the mistake of making something so complicated. Oh, my cousin made a logo for me, and it's you know it's a football player with a suit on and an angry face and glasses, and you know holding a briefcase, and 
you know, he's walking upstairs and there's a sunlight, a sunrise behind him and there's mm -hmm. a star. And they're like, this is my logo. And it's like, okay, now I'd like to see you embroider that, right? Or I'd like to see you uh, shrink that down to a business card and it's going to look like a blob that nobody can, can see. Or it's so detailed that if you were to add color to it, you know, you'd probably need to go full color all the time, full color, right? So simple is better. Uh, I like to start, and I know you agree with me here, We our, our method is to start with a black and white logo. Yes. Right? Yes, we usually start in black and white because it needs to work as like a silhouette without color. Um, the client might not be able to print something in full color. It's usually cheaper to print in black and white. Um, so your logo needs to work um, without any color and still needs to be recognizable. Um, so we always start in black and white. Yep, excellent. Um, I'm just sending a quick uh, text here. The other thing too is that, because I got, I don't know if you can hear, I got a lawnmower guy going out in, in the front front of the house. Um, the, the problem is that you want, what you're trying to do is minimize moving parts. If you present a, a, a set of logo ideas to your client and you also have added color to them, they may just completely like derail um, a concept, not because of the symbol, mm -hmm. but because of the color. They don't express that. And so yeah. at PD, we, we like to do black and white to start. Um, and then once it's nailed down, once they've selected a direction, and it could be a combination of direction, I think that when you're doing logo design, our approach is develop three to five concepts, um, different directions. And by directions, I mean that you may have a serif font, which gives a more high-end feel, or you may have a sans serif font that gives a more uh, modern technological feel. You may have an icon or you may not. You, you may have an icon or you may have a, just a straight up typographical logo. And now the client can say, okay, I kind of want to go with an icon, but I like the typography from number three. Can you combine this? Mm -hmm. And now we start moving forward. And I don't add color. We don't add color until that client is like hook, line, and sinker. They say, we love number three. Uh, kind of like what happened with uh, Dr. Tawe, which we'll, we'll get to. Uh, but then we add color and we'll talk a little bit about fonts and colors, Amanda. Let's, let's talk a little bit about how we take those elements because um, colors have psychological effects mm -hmm. and we've talked about this in some of our other content. But talk a little bit about how we take that and then we roll that into the brand guidelines a little bit. Yeah, so when choosing a font, fonts, I like to say have personalities. Um, each one sort of conveys something different. Serifs usually is more uh, for stately, serious, uh, stoic um, versus a sans serif that feels more modern, um, younger. Um, and then even like smaller elements, whether they have little details on them can change the way they um, feel and look, which I'll discuss more when we get into some of these case studies. Um, and then colors the same way, you know, that we have all sorts of associations with colors. Um, for instance, to bring up McDonald's again, the uh, red and yellow makes you hungry. Right. Um, so of course it's associated a lot of times with food. It's a great, uh, point. it's a great point because for some, for some industries, if you're a financial advisor, you might want to use green uh, mm -hmm. for money or, or blue for trust. I know that we use a book from the Color Institute, uh, Color Theory Institute, that we rely on a lot because, believe it or not, well, the easiest thing to do is give give our, our viewers an example of a daycare. If you were opening up a daycare and it was called, you know, uh, Einstein's Playground or something like that, you might have the playground part of the logo be like whimsical, right? Mm -hmm. like whimsical letters, uh, and then use primary colors. Uh, but if you were, if your company was, uh, you know, Einstein's Laboratories, then you would probably have uh, more formal lettering, and and maybe you weren't using um, 
primary colors because it's a more serious kind of tone that your business is taking in. So that's kind of like our process in thinking of who's the audience, what's the product, what are they selling, what's the tone we want to evoke from a look and feel standpoint. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then from there, once once we have that color, the icon, the typography, once the client says yes, we love that. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is always sometimes nice. Sometimes it happens sooner than later, right? Huh? Sometimes it happens early and sometimes it takes a while. Yeah, it, it all it's very, it varies all the time. Like um, when we get to Taui, he was like, like that one, like that one, done. <laughs> Um, and other times with um, when we get to like UCA and JFS, it's much slower of a process where we're going back and forth, trying to figure out exactly what they want. Although with them, there's also like multiple people um, on it as well, which is that whole design by committee yeah. where you have more than one person you need to satisfy. Um, yeah, we can't, we can't stress that enough. Like the more people in the room, uh, Sometimes you get people what they need to they need to validate why they're in the room so they have an opinion and and then we're we're designing by committee and that that sometimes will take will make the project take a lot longer. Um, if we're dealing directly with the business owner and he's the he or she is the decision maker, sometimes it goes a lot faster and that, that that's kind of uh, and I think when a client knows like really like what what they what they really you know what they really want out of it um you know they understand their business they understand their their target they're more likely to kind of nail it faster it's 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 the other way around when they're not sure and they're leaving it up, up to us to kind of figure it out for them the process may take a little bit longer yeah um and then afterwards, we create a brand guideline for them so that this usually helps them may re, uh, remain consistent when using it, which is extremely important um, when creating a logo. You want to mm -hmm. always use the same color, um, make sure that um, when you're using it in one color, it's the right color. You're not changing the typography or the font. You're not squishing it or stretching it. Um, that you retain its integrity. Um, so that way, no matter what it's used on, someone can look at it and recognize it as your logo. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. So Fernanda is trying to figure out why I'm off camera, but I'm still here. So we'll, we'll keep going. Um, let's talk about um, some of our favorite case studies. Um, Split Cart and My Alibi are, are two of my kind of favorite startup uh, logo solutions that we came up with. Um, and, um, you know, we, we can see if we could pull up some, some examples of that um, at some point. Um, I think Fernanda's working on that. No, nope, that's Modern Plastics. So we want to have Split Cart. Hey, there I am. Oh, there you are. <laughs> uh, Split cart and my alibi. Those are the ones we want to talk about now. So there we go. So these two, let's talk a little bit about these two. Uh, and, and for the folks watching, just enjoy the fun. This is live. Uh, we're, we're at work and we're sharing our knowledge with you. Um, and so we're going to have some fun stuff happen, like some of us disappear and then we come back a few minutes later. It's just all, all in good fun. Uh, so split cart. Um, that was an interesting concept. It was a similar idea to, um, you know, Venmo or some of these platforms where like if you and your friends are out to dinner um, and instead of everybody like putting their credit cards in uh, and splitting it four ways, you could use split cart uh, to pay for things. Like if you were going away on a trip and your friend and one of your friends, you know, uh, you know, bought the trip, you could split online purchases with your friends. And I thought that was an interesting concept. And I love what we came up with them because we actually took a shopping cart and just kind of split it just slightly, which I think is super cool. 
Um, and you want to talk to us a little bit about my alibi because I I, I happen to love this. And if you look closely, there is something in there. If you want to tell tell our viewers a little bit about how we came up with that icon. Yeah. So my alibi is uh, another app, um, and the the purpose of it was so that um, parolees can check in um, mm -hmm. in the app, like using their thumbprint. Um, so that's where the icon came from. So it's a fingerprint, but in the center of it is the at symbol because mm -hmm. uh, it's letting you know where they're at. Right. Absolutely. And, and, you know, parolees and people, uh, that are incarcerated, you know, they get, they get fingerprinted. This is, this is your unique ID. Uh, and we felt like putting the at symbol inside of there had like this double meaning where we, it looks like a thumbprint. Mm -hmm. It has an at symbol, but it's where you are located because it's going to use GPS. It's going to use geo tracking to verify where you are. So this was like for parolees and parole officers to basically track instead of wearing like an ankle bracelet, uh, you can utilize this app. And what I want our viewers to really watch or pay attention to in these two examples uh, is the simplicity of the logo. The typography is simple. The iconography is simple, and we really don't recommend more than two colors for your logo. So you're also seeing that here. Again, all, either one of these logos would work well in black and white, but also they could work well in one color. And when we, when we spoke about the brand guidelines uh, earlier, we would provide the PMS color, the Pantone color matching system, we would provide the PMS colors uh, for the logo so that wherever you use uh, a printer or a sign maker or you're doing promotional material and the, are the standard across the globe is the PMS color matching system. So you want to make sure for consistency that you follow your brand guidelines, that your printers and your vendors are using your, your that they're, they're retaining the integrity of your brand. Right, so you don't want to squish the letters, you don't want to have them recreate the logo, you want to send them a vector file, and you want to send them the PMS colors. You want to be ideally if you have an ad going out or you're getting something printed, you're getting a truck wrapped, you're getting uniforms made, send your printer your brand guidelines along with your logo so that they can follow and retain the integrity of your brand. Super, super important, and we did touch on on Vector Investor earlier. So let's talk a little bit about brand hierarchy. Um, and uh, and I think one of the ones that, that we start that out with uh, actually uh, is JFS Care at Home. And, and for those watching that aren't familiar with brand hierarchy, brand hierarchy has to do with where do logos align with each other relationship-wise when you have a company or organization that has multiple subdivisions or sub brands below a overarching brand. And in the case of, of JFS Care at Home, um, they were part of the JFS family, which is Jewish, Jewish Family Services. And so Jewish Family Services had all these different kind of sub brands that went along with it. And the previous designer, had created, if you look at your screen, the bottom one is where, where they started out with. Um, and all of their brands had the same kind of look and feel. They, they had the same color palette, the blue and yellow. Um, they had an icon on the left and they had the, the JFS kind of spread out. The problem was, or the challenge that we were faced or we had to solve for this client was that uh, JFS Care at Home was, uh, a, uh, they provided services to seniors living at home or that needed care at home. Because the, the logo was so closely related to JFS or Jewish Family Services, there became this misperception about the brand that the workers were Jewish or the care providers were Jewish and that the, the people that they would care for were Jewish. And they were like, no, we, we offer our services to everyone. You know, not just Jewish people. We need to pull away from JFS care. We need to show more of a distant relationship to them. And so how do we do that, right? And, and we started by renaming them. 
Uh, so there's this naming process that took place where we, we, we basically flip-flopped the emphasis. So we put JFS at the end, so we renamed them Care at Home by JFS. But the reason that's important is because these organizations shared, uh, they shared a board of directors. So the board of directors were like, no, we still want this affinity from an internal standpoint. So from a uh, B2B or inward facing standpoint, they needed to show this relationship, but from an external standpoint, consumer facing, they wanted to show something entirely different. So tell us a little, tell our viewers about how we came up with this iconography, Amanda, because it really, it's not what you think of first when you think of- Yeah, no. <laughs> it, it took me a while to kind of figure out what to do for them. Um, this is another one. Of, this is one of the cases in which I did a lot of word association, trying to figure out what care and home could mean symbolically, other than the, you know, the first thought of a house with a roof. Um, so for this, for the by the, the way, by the way, these guys, this this whole industry was super crowded with the same. Yeah, the logos. It was always like a house with hands, or, or a, a house, heart, a heart with a house with a house. So one of the things we wanted to do was when we did our competitive market analysis, and this is something we recommend our viewers to do: look at your competitors and look what they're doing. And if you want to be different, don't do what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, so with the concepts, we did several that kind of like varied between. Clo really close to the original uh, to really far away from the um, original concept. Um, so they ended up going with the furthest one away. And so the iconography, so to me, you care for um, your family, you care for your pets, and then you, you can care for like a garden and help it grow and thrive. Um, so, and the potted plant, I chose because it's something you keep in your home. And instead of doing a, a house with a roof, other things that could be representative of a house, I thought of a window. Mm -hmm. So a potted plant in the window is something that you care for. Um, and then I added the sort of decorative sun above the plant to sort of tie back into that sun that they use in the original icon uh, for uh, Jewish family services. Yeah, I absolutely love this. I, I love where we ended up with. The client loved it. It tells a story. A plant, if, if, you know, if, you, if you've taken care of plants, I know Fernanda loves taking care of plants. I hope she waters our plants. But by the way, they thrive with human interaction, even though it's a plant. It's like people, some people even talk to their plants. And so, I love the fact that you know you have these seniors that are at home and they're in their own home. So care at home is not a facility that you mm -hmm. send your parents to, but they actually send caretakers to your home so that it's kind of like, hey, grandma is, is in her home and she's thriving. She has human interaction, people are caring for her, or they're even supporting a, a, uh, a child, that, an adult child that's taking care of their aging parent. They get support from, from care at home. And another thing I want to point out before we move on is that we changed the typography as well. Um, yes. so we broke rank uh, to show a distance relationship from the corporate brand uh, mm -hmm. in, in several ways. We, we changed uh, the emphasis, but we also changed the font. But we kept, and we changed the iconography, but we kept the color palette to show yes. the connection. So that's yes. And we also, the typography for JFS, just those letters yeah. are the same as the original. Right. Show that connection. And you can see them on your screen now um, so that you can see that there's still an affinity. Um, but it's important to note that you need a breadcrumb trail because there were plenty of people, customers, ha happy customers, that, ha that saw nothing wrong with JFS care at home whatsoever. And so if we were to depart too far away from their current branding, you run the risk of their existing, happy, loving, loyal clients wondering, hey, what's going on? Did, did something change? And then if that happens, it's bad. If that happens, you get people that may jump ship 
they may they may have been on the fence about renewing and now they're like i don't know what's going on there it looks different maybe the service changed maybe they cut their budget who knows all of which is not good so you want to have a seamless transition you want to have a brand evolution so excellent let's talk a little bit about uca um the urban community alliance a, another one of our favorites mm -hmm. We love working with, with Dr. Akbar and, and, um, and Shirley and Jessica and the great works that they're doing. It's another example of us, you know, using our powers for good and helping, helping these organizations rebrand. And this one, you know, we, it was challenging because it, it, it was not a easy task. We, we took two companies, uh, two organizations that merged. We created a new one. We wanted to have some connection to the past. Um, we, we were stuck with kind of a long name that we knew people were going to refer to this as an acronym. Um, so we felt like, how do we, if, if, again, this goes back to too many moving parts. If we have an acronym and we have a name and we have a symbol, we basically have an explosion in a spaghetti factory. We really just have to like pick, pick two of these, pick one of these. And we knew that, uh, Internally, they were going to refer to this as UCA, and that externally, consumer-facing, they were going to refer to this as UCA. So we, so the challenge here, Amanda, and, and I love that we have some of your, your previous concepts here. Uh, I want you to talk about how we got there. Uh, mm -hmm. We basically had to create an icon out of the acronym. Yes, which um, you can see from the concepts that we tried several different types of icons within mm -hmm the acronym uh, mm -hmm. with hands, uh, trying to show alliance and connection and community. Ultimately, they ended up going with just the uh, UCA, but initially the um, the font that I used, they, um, it was too um, harsh. They yes. wanted something softer, something friendlier. Um, so I, th this, the UCA portion of the font is actually a heavily modified version of the um, of the font used in one of the concepts, where I completely softened up all the edges um, just to make it feel more approachable. Um, yes. And um, so that's where the icon the icon came from, and then the color palette we sort of pulled from their old um logo with the greens and uh the kind of orangey uh golden color and the burgundy just to give it that connection uh, to where they used to be right because a part of this was the director the director of the new haven family alliance was going to run uca and and but yet we wanted to show the emphasis like one of the things now the vets logo was not one of my favorite logos i thought it was too complicated but what it does illustrate was a sense of unity or helping and mm -hmm. with the people holding hands. That particular program paired up like uh, veterans, uh, military vets with, with youth that needed mentorship. And so you, they had this whole thing of, of people holding hands. And I think we wanted to kind of translate that over into this new icon. So we kind of have the letters almost embracing each yep. other and connecting. If you see how the, the C is wrapping around the U, um, and then we retained the word Alliance from New Haven Family Alliance. And I felt like their color palette was strong. So again, they may have had collateral, they may have had marketing materials, they may have had signage, sometimes furniture. Like if you come to our office, God forbid we ever change our color because like everything is red. And, and in, in the cases where a company is merging uh, or, or acquiring or, or creating a new entity, there is some legacy a collateral that they may have. And so for them, it was very important to uh, that we retain that color palette. And so uh, I really love what we netted out. Um, you can see that some of the earlier renditions of UCA, we were trying to do too much. Sometimes we're guilty of doing too much. And if a logo is doing too much, uh, you got to you gotta kind of scale it down. And, and that's okay. You, you, you basically, during the creative process, you're not going to nail it like boom, I'm done. It's you're gonna you're basically looking to see like how far can I push in this direction? How far can I push in that direction? You're basically I like to, I like to think of it as like 
I'm trying to find where the walls are. Mm-hmm. So if I find out where the walls are, now I can now I can kind of navigate and I can get to where I'm going. But if there are no walls, you could be you could go off in the wrong direction at infinitum, and 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 that eats up time. Clients get frustrated. We get frustrated. We, you know, so we need walls. And in this case here, our walls were like, look, here are two very well known, very well respected entities. We want to create a new one. We want to honor them. We want to pay homage to them. And you can do that with colors and fonts. And uh, and and by the way, I love the font. What what is the name that we ended up the font? Do you recall? Because um, we, we're using it. Um, what was it? So there's two fonts used here. Um, there's the modified version of Gotham, which is what Community mm-hmm. Alliance is. But then Urban, because I felt like the R in the Urban really Thank kind you. of connected into the shape of like the C. That is, mm-hmm. I believe it's called Filson. Um, mm-hmm. I love it because, like, when we talk about brand guidelines, we were able to provide the client with brand guidelines so that they know what fonts to use on their presentations, on their banners, on their emails, so that it aligns with their creative. And so that is what really starts to button up and tighten up your overall branding for your company is when you're using a specific set of fonts that are unique to your organization or your business. Um, you know, you, you can see it with a lot of the major brands. Um, they, they have a particular font that they use, and that's what they stick with. And that's what helps people build that trust with that brand because you, you're realizing, okay, without me having to read this entire doc, this is UCA, or this is PD, or this is Modern Plastics. You know, we want to create brand guidelines and the importance of disseminating those guidelines, not, not just externally to all your vendors, but internally, to anyone that's communicating in any way within your organization, they should be following the guidelines, especially when you rebrand, because now you've got to kind of indoctrinate everybody into this new into this new thing. Um, excellent. Now let's talk a little bit about um, our most recent project, uh, Prime Metaspot. Mm-hmm. And uh, that one we, we named, and I know we have – we could have a separate conversation about naming a company where we're actually going to stick to the logo, but that process in and of itself is fun. And um, oftentimes, as I've mentioned, that gets driven by what um, URLs are available and not available and what the vision and goal and, you know it might be for the organization. But we nailed it with Prime Metaspot. Dr. Tawe absolutely loved the name. Yeah. It was available. Um, and we had a lot of fun with this one. Talk to us about your process. Uh, once we kick this off, you go to the drawing board and you're starting to think of like maybe maybe share a little bit about our conversations and what thoughts were going through your head as far as symbolism goes. Yeah. So for the symbolism, um, I w- I also want to say there's a lot the client doesn't see. Um, so there's there's a whole other set of like discarded icons and logos. Um, that don't end up as the final ones that we send off to the client. So there, there are some um, icons that were just like not good enough or needed to be heavily modified when doing this one. Um, but the idea of it was to combine medicine, create something that was medicine, um, proprietary with the P for prime, but also sort of still keeping in the spa aspect without getting too feminine uh, because it's supposed to be for both men and women. Um, And I really like where we ended up. I was like, when I first did this concept, um, it looked very, it looked different before um, when I showed it to Ramon, this is the importance of collaboration uh, because I was so focused on the concept, which is basically that I wanted to create the shape of someone uh, doing one of the meditation poses, but out of a stethoscope. Um, and the original uh, concept, the original icon was the the hands or the arms of the stethoscope were more in a teardrop shape and the P was a circle. And when I showed it to Ramon, I was focused on the concept that I completely overlooked this um, aspect of the logo. Yeah. All he saw was uh, a particular part of the female anatomy. <laughs> 
Right. Um, yes. Which uh, Dr. Tawe was more specialized in a particular procedure might have been okay. Um, exactly. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, we because I showed it to him, he saw it. what I did not see because I was just so focused on the idea of it. Um, mm -hmm. I end up changing it, which I think it's, it's now much stronger. Uh, mm -hmm. Where the the head, which was the circle originally, is now the P, and the arms are in more of a um, rounded square shape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and I love it, and I think that that in of, in and of itself will look amazing um, on on a mug, uh, on a, you know, on a shirt, on a uniform. Um, without the entire name next to it. And that's that's ultimately like when I know we have a successful mark is when I feel like the icon can live on its own. Uh, so it, it's awesome. I, I absolutely love what we netted out with that. Um, we can look at some of the sketches below and see that some of them didn't even have an icon. Um, and, and some, and, and and the reason being is because in our brief, and I just want to mention how important the creative briefs are, we, we, we have our clients kind of talk to us, give us a sense of, are they looking for an icon? Are they looking for typographical logo? What logos do they like? And, and Dr. Tawe actually referenced Coca-Cola, which is just mm -hmm. uh, a typographical mark. It doesn't have an icon. And so we wanted to entertain that with them. We, you know, one of the things I learned uh, working with Jay way back in the day was, if he asked me to do something, and, and I'm re referencing Jay Walker here, um, I would have to, even if I had a better idea, I still had to show him what he asked me for, because he would disregard my idea if I didn't do that. And so we kind of have to do that with our clients. Sometimes if a client asks for something, even though we might not think it's the best solution for them, we want to show it to them in the company of our ideas. Uh, because if we ignore that, they may you may you may just have you know solved the, the riddle of the Sphinx, and they don't want to they don't care about it because they don't see what they asked for. And I think once Dr. Taiwe saw the power of having an icon, he was on board with it, um, and and we nailed it. But you know, it's a testament to the work that goes in before. Like you said, the client doesn't see so much. There's so much that hits the the cutting room floor that if we do our research. We, we collaborate internally, we listen to our clients, we're going to have a much better shot of nailing it um, when they actually start to see the concepts. And um, this, this, was a, this was a great example. Um, I think we're doing pretty, pretty good on time. Um, I, I do, I do want to say that we're now working on the, the, the brand guidelines and the marketing collateral for Prime Meta Spa. So we're like, much like we did for CT Spine Doc, uh, now we're going to take this color palette, and here's the important thing that a lot of our viewers might not realize is that the color palette that we identify for the logo is now we give we hand that that off to Jorge and the web team, and they're implementing that color palette into the website, and then you're going to also implement that color palette into like the brochures and yep. business cards, right? Exactly. So um, that's something that's really key. So you, you may think like, well, I just need a quick logo. But that logo, not only does it communicate everything that your company is about, but it in and of itself drives the rest of your creative um, and, and throughout your company, you know, from your web to your print to your digital to all of your content. Uh, it's super, super important. Um, so let's talk about as we wrap up, let's talk about brand refresh. And the reason why is because we may have a lot of viewers out there that have a logo already. And, and they're like, well, I haven't changed my logo in 75 years. I haven't changed my logo in five years. I, I, I'm coming up on, a, on, a, on an anniversary. My company's 50 years old. My company's 25 years old. My company's 10 years old. Those are all great opportunities to do a brand refresh. And what a brand refresh does, if you look at like what Stop and Shop did, and I'm just going to, I know this is going off script a little bit, but Stop and Shop, uh, they're, they're some, they, they got a new CEO, and the CEO was like, hey, guys, we're falling behind to like Whole Foods. We got no prepared foods. Our, our profits are down. You know, we, we, need a, we need a boost. We need a shot in the arm. They call it a shot in the arm. It's kind of like when you get like an adrenaline rush, you know, um, 
that's what the CEO felt like the company needed. So what does he do? He calls for an entire rebrand of Stop and Shop, which costs them hundreds of millions of dollars because they've got to do uniforms and trucks and parking lots and signs and stores. And But what it does is it gives the, that new CEO an opportunity to put their store back on the radar and say, hey, check us out. We're, we're up to date. We're brand new. We're not the same old stop and shop. Now, mind you, that customer experience has to be better this time around or, it's, or else it's a gigantic waste of money. So large companies do it, but small companies can also do it. And I want to talk a little bit about modern plastics and, and what we did for them. Um, and, and I know that they're, they're a friend to us, a friend to, to PD. I'm a big fan of Bing. He, he's one of my mentors, um, clients, friends. Uh, what we ended up doing for Modern Plastics was we evolved their logo. They needed, first of all, they needed an icon, right? You want to tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. um, that process, Amanda, because they came to us without an icon. They, they, yeah. Nowadays, you kind of need one for social media. Yeah, and I, if I recall correctly, they came to us a little differently than our other clients in that you saw a Facebook post. Yes. They were trying to... Uh, sort of they were starting the process of creating new logos but they went to um some like did they go to like a 99 designs or something no, like actually that? no and, and this is a good friend of mine as well brian i i, I owe him a debt of gratitude because he this guy is so gracious and so sincere but he was an intern for bing and um and he and he probably said look i'm a marketing student i'm gonna i'll work on your logo and so he took it upon himself to i don't know what software he used but um, what Bing did is Bing is very active on social media. So Bing took Brian's work and like posted it on, on Facebook. And, and then, you know, I, I'm a sucker for these posts where somebody says like, which one do you like better? And number, you know, A or B, you know, we're, we're doing, and I'm just like, you know, I'm cringing because it's almost like innocently they trivialize a very, very important aspect of business of, of branding their company. They make it so it's a, popularity contest and it's like no it's not about taking a poll to see who likes what better i mean this these aren't this okay yeah these are your facebook friends but this isn't your target audience they don't understand branding um they're just going to tell you what, what they quote unquote like and that's when you get comments like i don't know I, I want it to pop or they say something that's not a real like technical industry term and it, and it drives us crazy you know um uh, and so i couldn't help myself and i started commenting on it and I told Bing actually why his old logo was better than the stuff Brian was creating. But I saw where Brian was going. Brian mm -hmm. was trying to come up with an icon yep. because he knew, okay, if I'm in charge of social, I can't fit this entire logo inside the square box of an icon. So he was on the right track. Uh, we, uh, Bing just realized, okay, I need some professional help. And when he saw my comment, Credit to both of them that they weren't offended. They were actually like, okay, let's listen to this guy. And they brought me in to a meeting. And the rest is history. You know, I came in and we took on the project. They hired us to do the rebrand. And, and I'm actually quite proud of what we did because Brian actually had that swoosh in some of his versions that we, that we kept. Um, but we did add the color green because modern is very, very progressive as far as like being earth friendly and, and uh, they're doing, they have medical ISO certification. So they're doing like medical implants and stuff. I mean, these guys are really, really safe when it comes to plastic. So we felt like green was important. Um, but I want you to talk about the, the anniversary mark because you've, you've, you've done a bunch yeah. of these now. Uh, you yeah. recently did one for Gwen. Tell, tell our viewers about this one. So for this one, it's their 75th anniversary, which is a very long time. Um, I believe the, the, so when we did a little research, <laughs> the color for 75, I believe was silver. Mm -hmm. um, and so like anniversary logos gets to be a little bit more fun <laughs> than yeah. the, um, than their, you know, standard logo in that you can add gradients and bevels and be a little crazy because it's, it's a special event, special yeah. occasion. Um, so we went with like a silver look, adding the 75 right next to the end piece, keep it tight, 
uh, and contains, but it can still work on social media as just the icon um, without spelling out modern plastic celebrating 75 years. Um, so that was the kind of the process of that combining yeah. their logo with this new more fun anniversary. Yeah, no, I think it's a great solution. And Bing uses that. Uh, he, he, he produced a ton of promotional materials that he gave away to his best clients. Um, he, he created like, a, he got it printed on a box that's um, got like the wine openers inside. You know, he, he had hats made, he had banners made. He did a lot with it. And that's the, that's the beauty of it is that once you have a brand um, that's, you know, that's been refreshed, um, you don't alienate any of your existing customers, but you also can show your, your, your current customers and future customers that you're very forward facing. And, and it's a great way to get on the radar. You know, I think that our, our reveal of this incorporated a press release. Uh, and so, you, you know, he, he was able to email all of this um, database contacts and it, it, it's like, oh yeah, modern plastics. It just gives people a good reason to kind of get you back uh, top of mind uh, for all that you do. So um, any thoughts, any closing thoughts as we wrap up? I know we're coming up on an hour. We, we hope that we, we covered a lot of things and, and um, you know, we'd be happy to take questions um, from our viewership. Um, I think we covered, you know, being simple. Uh, for those that are out there that are new to logo design, Paul Rand is somebody that I highly recommend. Um, we actually think we have a pretty robust portfolio of good marks that you can look at on our website at PeraltaDesign.com. Um, Amanda, you and I have a great relationship with, when it comes to collaborating on these um, icons, and I really do believe uh, we owe a lot of that to the fact that we both draw it. So we can show each other very quickly what we're thinking, and, um, and that, that's a great tool versus just going uh, onto the computer and and no knock against any designers i'm sure there's some good ones out there that don't draw it's just my own personal belief that um you've got to be good with your hands you you, you know a true artist uh is very tactile and and, and can create i know amanda you make earrings and, and 3d sculptures and and uh, all kind of goodies um so you are a true artist and we're very very grateful to have you on our team and enjoy um um, working with you and, and the team loves you and, and uh, just a wealth of knowledge um, having gone to art school um, and, 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 and you know come right into a creative agency has been to me uh, a blessing because it's a tough it's a tough industry to crack and a lot of times folks jump in and um, they end up doing something else because they, they feel like they can't make it in this industry but um, it truly is I, I can't I can't, uh, you know, emphasize enough how blessed we both are to do what we love every day. Yeah. You know? I know I'm extremely lucky. Like, yeah. we, I've been here for eight years, right after graduating, like a month, I think, I graduated from UV. And then I started interning here and I haven't left, so doing something right. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And Tommy, thank you. Um, Tommy, your, your uncle, he's always been a big supporter of PD. Um, he gives us a shout out and, uh, and we appreciate you. Um, he's he's really that wide, so. Yeah. yeah. And he, he's a, he's a fellow artist. I mean, don't underestimate his abilities. Um, he, he's out there in Cali. Um, and, uh, I know that he's, he, he makes furniture, he paints, um, he, he's, he, he's got a, a great personality. Um, I enjoy, you know, he served us in the military. Um, he's just a solid dude and a fellow artist. And so, um, it, it feels really good to hear from our fellow artists that are out there. Um, you know, I think we can wrap up and, um, and we'll certainly follow up with other questions, um, offline. Um, there, there's a post up in the chat right now on how you can register for upcoming brand new live events. Uh, Amanda, you did amazing for your first one, first of many. Um, I think you're a natural and, and we'll, you know, I'm sure that, that our viewership will, will love to see more of you on, on future programs. Um, the importance of logo design, um, the importance of typography, the importance of brand guidelines, um, all of it, all of it is 
in an effort to distinguish you and differentiate your business from your competition and help communicate more effectively uh, why you are the business that that client should hire. And, and uh, it's a great, effective way to build team morale. As you can see, we love wearing swag in the office. Uh, but it also is constantly promoting your business out there uh, and putting you on the radar. You know, you see the biggest brands doing it. Uh, the Nikes and the, and the Reeboks and, and the, you know, the Mercedes and, and all the brands that are out there, um, the Starbucks, you see how much they invest in their brand identity and how their, their symbols end up being synonymous with the values that those companies stand for, uh, which is very, very powerful. So do yourself a favor. If you don't have a logo yet for your business or have one that needs to be evolved to that next level, now is the time to do it. Uh, and we'd be happy to help. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, and until next time, thank you for joining us here on Brand New Live. Bye.